Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see each one of you here. Good to see some new faces as well. I hope you have your hymnals with you this morning. We're beginning this morning with 553, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Good morning, folks. Welcome to our Community Bible Church. Good to have you here this morning, here and online. We have a few announcements to, to tell you. Um, again, we thank uh, Raul and Josephine Perez and Richard and Karen Helms uh, have met with the leadership and our desire uh, uh, to be here and uh, for membership. So thank you for, for, the, for that. I thank, thank you, Lord. And then um, today, immediately after the morning service, we will have our administrative business meeting. And um, so plan to stay for that uh, if, if, uh, if you want. If not, uh, you, you, you can go also. <laughs> and um, and there's, because there's no um, evening service. So um, uh, happy Labor Day for, uh, for tomorrow. And enjoy time with your family and friends. And then the ladies' precept study continu- Bible study continues this Friday at 9.30 a.m., uh, continuing the study of First Thessalonians. If you have any questions, um, contact um, Karen, Ms. Karen Badar. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Um, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, Lord, we thank you so much again for who you are, our Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, and thank you, Father, for for this church that you put us in. Thank you, Lord, that we can praise you, we can uh, minister to each other, we can glorify you, we can can serve you, Lord, and we're so thankful, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you give us your Holy Spirit to guide us, to teach us, to convict us, Lord, and help us always to praise you, to glorify you, Lord, in everything that we say, everything we do, do. Um, help us, Lord, to do that, because we can't do it ourselves, Lord, and uh, we thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that guides us and teaches us. Um, be with Pastor, Lord, uh, as he preaches your word. Give us understanding. Give us uh, your wisdom, Lord. Give us your will, Lord, as we hear your word. Thank you so much again for a beautiful day. Thank you for giving us breath, for giving us life, and for giving us eternal life, Lord, through your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is found on page 23, Worthy of Worship. I love the verse that they have underneath that title. From Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
sing this with great joy. is on the refrain this time. Sustainer, you are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Steve. Beautiful song. He is truly worthy. Um, before our scripture reading this morning is found in Revelation 9, chapter 19, verse 11 through 21. Okay. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. 
And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in it presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Amen. Amen. Um, at this time, if the men can prepare for our offering, tithes and offering. Um, Brother Frank, would you pray for our offering? The way you take care of all of our needs, Lord, we, we just recognize that it's all from your hand and that you take care of for this Lord. We just want to worship you in the giving. I just pray that we come to you with a cheerful heart and thanksgiving and just give back to you what you blessed us with. And, uh, it will be true worship unto you as part of our day to day. Give us wisdom on how to utilize the funds that come into the church. to have a violin duet and what a wonderful song, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. We don't have a thousand tongues here, but we do have an opportunity to use our voices once again to sing his praise. The next one is about how we are complete in Christ because of what he has done for us. 349. Let me ask you to stand as we sing. Thank you. 
All right, well, good morning to everyone here. Great to have you. All of our children will be dismissed at this time, and Chuck and Beverly will take real good care, and then the rest of you, you're stuck, right, or you're stuck with me. It's good to have all of you here. We've got a number of visitors uh, visiting uh, with... Um, Apologize here. Just give myself room. All right. Number of visitors, and we're glad that each one of you are here. And uh, if I haven't been able to meet you yet, I would love that opportunity before today is over. Now, let me just clarify. <laughs> Members, we want you to stay because we have a very important business meeting. Uh, and it'll only take uh, four or five minutes. After the service uh, is done, we'll sing a, a closing hymn. At that time, if you are visiting with us and you would rather not sit in, uh, although our business meeting is an open meeting, you're welcome to sit in and uh, observe. Um, the, uh, the duty, primary duty, will be for the members. However, if you're uh, interested in uh, wanting to sit in, that is fine. If you'd rather leave, then during the, uh, the closing hymn, you just slip out into the lobby. But honestly, I think four or five minutes, six at the most, and I think that's a stretch. Um, we just have one particular matter to attend to. Uh, a vote, and so if you can hang around after the service just for a few minutes, it'll just be a few, uh, like I say, a brief meeting, and then we'll be, glad, we'll be able to uh, fellowship with you. But I'm, I'm glad that you're here. It's good to have all of you here today. So take your Bibles and find Hebrews chapter 10 as we uh, really conclude uh, a portion of Scripture from last week and uh, concludes a, conclude a large section in this book of Hebrews. And so Hebrews chapter 10, if you will, uh, find your place and I will do the same. Happy Labor Day. Rex, do you need your tablet? I didn't want him not to have a game to play if he ever just decides to... Turn me off, right? So. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look to the scripture here. Uh, let's read a verse or passage of scripture. Hebrews 10. We'll begin reading in verse number 11 and we'll read through verse number 18. And I have that on the screen so you can follow along. Hebrews 10, verse 11, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, 
I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Let's have a word of prayer and ask for God's help in our time together this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the privilege of just singing praise to you. Our hearts have been stirred already in uh, lifting up our voices in praise to you. The fact that we are complete in you is worthy of every day, uh, not only the praise of our lips, but the walk of our lives and the attitude of our hearts. And we pray that you'd help us to uh, be mindful of uh, your grace and your mercy that's been extended to us. And Father, we specifically pray that this morning uh, we confess that the work is greater than any of us can accomplish on our own. This is spiritual work. It's not, the, it's not a battle with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers in the high places. And Father, we give you praise that you have been exalted above all powers, all authority, and all rule. And so, Lord, the work that needs to be done today, we rely on you to do it. We confess that your church is on the move, and we pray that you would continue today marching forward and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Whatever the work that needs to be done in our hearts and lives today, Father, I pray that by your Spirit, through your Word, you would do the work that only you can do. This is what we need, that we might leave today knowing more of you, knowing you better, being more submissive to who you are, and having the joy overflow us as we walk each day until the day that we see you face to face. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last week's message on Christ's obedient, willing sacrifice, it really laid a groundwork for the conclusion of this section. This section, as we mentioned last week, is really concluding a long portion of the book of Hebrews. We've been at this for weeks and months. We started back in chapter 4. Verse number 13, with the, uh, the text uh, of Jesus as a high priest, the context of Jesus being a high priest. And so we have looked at Old Testament passages, Psalm 110. We have studied the Old Testament character, Melchizedek. We have looked at extensively at the Levitical, the priestly system of the Old Covenant, uh, the sacrificial system. And we have looked at all of that and all uh, just constantly, the author here brings us to the point we cannot miss. Jesus Christ is supreme. He's superior. He far exceeds all of those types and shadows that came before to point to the one who would come. And so we are now at this conclusion. In fact, last week, we had given enough groundwork to uh, lay a uh, a basic summary and conclusion. However, I didn't want to do that because there was a phrase here that caught my attention and I just didn't want to let it go. And so this week we're going to return to this passage of Scripture. So let me give you four final thoughts on this section. And we find them in each of these verses that the author gives to us, beginning in verse 11, concluding with verse number 18. Verses 11 and 12, we find that Christ's work as high priest has been accomplished. It is done. This has been the focus since 413 of recounting the daily rites of the priests, um, the superior priesthood of Jesus being called uh, by God, assigned a priest after the order of Melchizedek. All of this has been established. Look at verse 11 and 12 again. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. So here, once again, we've seen this comparison contrast for the last number of chapters, the old with the new. Here we simply see that every priest, there were many, we were reminded of that, they stand daily because their, their uh, sacrifices had to be continually repeated uh, daily and yearly, uh, in the service of the high priest. And so the same sacrifices, which we know 
were the, uh, the blood offerings of bulls and goats and other animals, which could never take away sin. Now, we've given that information, and now we look to Christ. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. There's a number of things that we need to be reminded about here. Number one, it was one offering, not a repeated offering. It was once for all. The one offering of Christ's body and his blood was sufficient. This is far superior, and it was the basis for our forgiveness of sins. Not only that, but he offered the sacrifice of himself, and that was really the basis of our message last week. Christ was not like the Old Testament priests offering the blood of another animal. Every priest went home after his daily duty. Christ gave his life. We know three days later, because it was not possible for sin to have any power or dominion over him, and death the same, that he was raised from the dead. However, he, in contrast to the priests who stand daily, he is seated, not for rest, but to reign and to rule because his work has been accomplished. And so uh, Christ's work as high priest is accomplished. We also see number two there in verse number 12. He sat down at the right hand of God. We know that Christ has been exalted to the right hand of God. His work is done. He reigns as king. Now, I'd like to just spend a few minutes here because in my uh, in my life, looking back, there are um, ways to emphasize things in preaching that a preacher himself may not recognize and realize. And I know that this is true about me. You, you know my mannerisms. You, you know my speech and my type. You, you know some of the illustrations that I think would be great, and you've heard them for the seventh time. You know, all of this. We, we all have these Uh, perhaps deficiencies or um, idiosyncrasies in the way that we speak, and um, that conveys a message. But looking back over all the years of the the numbers of services that I sat in through my years of, of, of youth and college and young adult life, there seemed to be a lot more focus on things that the Scripture doesn't focus on and a neglect of the things that are very obvious once we take a a serious look at the Scriptures. For example, Jesus reigning one day. That was always the message with Jesus reigning. One day. He will be king one day. And I'm guessing if you lived in the Old Testament times and you really understood the prophetic scriptures, you could say that. Our King Jesus, though you wouldn't have known his name, the Messiah, would rule and reign. But the aspect of when he would rule and reign has been lost on many people because we've, um, we've designated that to a future time. One day he will reign. And I'd like for us just to look at Scripture this morning and be reminded because it was not until a couple years ago that I really got a grasp on how much the New Testament talks about Jesus Christ being exalted and reigning right now. Let's begin. Look at Matthew 26, 64. Jesus before the authorities They're accusing him of blasphemy, of claiming to be God, to be deity, to be Messiah, the Christ, the prophesied one of the Old Testament. (coughs) Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, this is in reference to, are you the Christ? Tell me, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? You have said so, Jesus said, but I tell you from now on... (coughs) You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. When Mark concludes his gospel, he mentions in verse 19, So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 2, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost 
This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing, in reference to the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day there. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Stephen not only heard that Jesus had ascended and was seated at the right hand of God, Stephen saw him. It's an amazing passage, Acts chapter 7. Stephen, the mob was against him, didn't like his message. They were taking up uh, stones to take his life. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. All throughout the New Testament, we do not see the emphasis that one day Jesus will reign. One day Jesus will rule. One day he will be king. From the moment of his ascension and exaltation, the apostles and the the writers of the New Testament continue to mention he has risen and he is reigning. Ephesians is just one passage of scripture that I'd like for you to hear. We are encouraged by the author to know the greatness of the riches of the inheritance that we have and the hope of our calling and the power of God, which has been demonstrated. Verse 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Jesus, descendant of David, would have a throne that never ends. And the writer says he is on that throne now, and there's no one higher, not in this age, nor in the age to come. Verse 22, and he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here's a passage of scripture that we looked at last week, Philippians chapter 2, and the exalt, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the humbling of our Savior. We'll go back to pick up context in verse number 8. Philippians 2, verse 8, and being found in human form, this is Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. It was a year or two ago that we came through this passage and we studied it and we asked what that name was, that name that was above every name, that name that's been specifically given to Jesus Christ. And I made the argument that that name is simply four letters, L-O-R-D. He is Lord. He is ruler. He is supreme. He is highest. He is Lord. And that there is coming a day when every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Do not fall into the number of years that I did thinking that one day Jesus will reign. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's been exalted He is seated at the right hand of God because his work, his sacrificial work as our high priest has been accomplished. We also see verse number 14 in Hebrews, the third thing. 
For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The work of Christ that is accomplished is our perfection. Notice what he says here. By a single offering, by the offering of Christ, by the death of Christ on the cross, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Those who belong to God have been determined. Our destiny is set. It is final. There is no question about it. God's children, as we heard in Romans chapter 8, those whom he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. In the mind of God and the will of God, and in the ages that exist now and the age to come, that is determined. There's now forgiveness, the aspect of our destiny. It is set, and so that has been determined. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. One more thing, verse 15, he says, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. This is the second time that uh, our author has gone back into the Old Testament to Jeremiah 31, 31, into a passage of Scripture and pulled it out and talked about the day future when God would establish a new covenant. Not like the old one, which the fathers broke when they disobeyed, but I will establish a new covenant. And so the author of Hebrews has already determined that that new covenant is not a one-day deal as well, that it is now. Jesus said the night before his betrayal and death, this is my blood which is shed for you. It is the blood of the new covenant which is given for the forgiveness of sins. And so the author here is reminding us that the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with believers now that this day has been accomplished. The day that Jeremiah spoke about in chapter 31, the new covenant, it has been established in Jesus Christ. And he has written his on our hearts. He has given to us the Holy Spirit. Because of this, he's also put an end to the Old Covenant. This has been the argument of the last couple chapters of our author here in Hebrews. Because the new has come, there is no need for the old as well. And where there's forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So these four things are complete. They need to be seen that way by believers. There's an aspect of rest, of confidence, of faith and hope in the believers, by looking at these scriptures and knowing that they have been determined. The plan of God will not and cannot be thwarted. These things are as good as done. They are accomplished. If we were to use one word to summarize this entire section, it would be the word finished. It harkens back to the cross where Jesus said those words, it is finished. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it finished? Is it finished? Trick question, I know. We're so bad at setting you guys up with trick questions. Well, let's think about this. Is the work as Jesus as uh, the work of Jesus as high priest? Is that done? As far as sacrifice? Yes, the author makes that very clear. Um, What were the things that the priest would do, though? Besides offering a sacrifice, he would mediate, right? You remember that? He was the go-between, between God and the people. And part of his work was sacrificial, daily routine. Part of his work was mediatorial. Let me ask you a question. Has that work? been completed by Christ? Is it over and done? No, the author of Hebrews has already given to us two passages earlier, chapter 2 and chapter 7, where we are told 
Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God. No more sacrificing. That's done. But he is there to make intercession on our behalf. Now, that is a wonderful thing, and that is something that you need to remember. That is unfinished. We'll get back to our slide here. Unfinished. That is one aspect that is not completed yet. What about believers? Are we finished? We've been perfected. As good as, as our glorification is determined. In fact, you know, my dad, years ago, the passage that we read in Revelation, dad said to me one day, and it's kind of affected the way that I think about it. And I don't even know, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about the apocalyptic nature of the book of Revelation. But my dad said to, to me one day, he said, Do you ever realize that when John was on the island, receiving all of these visions, that he saw you coming with Christ on the clouds in glory. We read that passage where the king is coming and behind him are the saints robed pure and white. Are you going to be in that group? Am I going to be in that group? I hope the answer to that is yes. And if that's the case, then John had a vision nearly 2,000 years ago, and he saw it all take place. It's an amazing thing. Let's go back to this, though. But our, as believers, are we done? Uh, there, there's still a, a whole lot of work that needs to be done in my own life and in your life as well. You'll notice here there's multiple ways that this can be translated, and the Scripture all throughout presents multiple aspects of our salvation that we have been delivered, that we are being delivered on a daily basis, and that one day we will be delivered, the past, the present, and the future. And he writes here in this verse, uh, verse number um, 14, he, he writes of us who have been perfected that we are still in the process of being sanctified, of being made more like Christ. And so, that still is a work that is ongoing. What about the new covenant? Is it done? Is it over? It's been established. And for 2,000 years, there have been many uh, inaugurated into this kingdom aspect of the new covenant. However, we also go back to the book of Revelation. Look at this passage. This is Revelation 21 when we're told there was a new heaven and a new earth. Notice verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Now, if you go back to Ezekiel and Je uh, Jeremiah, both who prophesied extensively of the new covenant that would come, both of these phrases are found within that future new covenant. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Well, that is true now. Both Romans, Paul, and in 1 Peter, Peter mentions that a people that were not God's people would be called God's people, quoting Hosea from the Old Testament. But here, in the new heavens and the new earth, this is going to take on a greater reality because He truly will be with us, dwelling together, we as His people, He as our God. Notice this continuation of this. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Has that happened yet? And death shall be no more. Has that been conquered yet? nor crying, or neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Stub your toe lately, hit the wrong nail with a hammer. You had any accidents lately? You still feel that pain? This is a promise of a day future where there truly will be a dwelling with our God. For the former things have passed away. So the aspect here 
about believers and the new covenant, Jesus as high priest, there's still a not yet finished aspect to them. And that's what I focus here in Hebrews, because as we come back to Hebrews, verse number 13, this is not my message, it's simply coming straight out of the text. The author did not leave this alone. He has talked about all the things that have been accomplished, things that have been done, things that are superior, supreme. It is finished. That is his cry to this point. But he does give us the statement that causes us to recognize there are still aspects that are future. Now, notice here verse 13. Christ, who has seated at the right hand of God, verse 13, is waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. This is a passage of Scripture that indicates that Christ, although he is on the throne, although all power and dominion and authority has been granted to him, he has not yet fully and finally taken all aspects of that reign. There is a patient delay in the coming of Christ. Notice Hebrews 2 Our authors already mentioned this before. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, Psalm 8, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Small percentage fulfillment with Adam. Large, big picture fulfillment with the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Now, notice how he continues. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him. Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Paul also writes about this aspect of the reign of Christ being a not yet fully fulfilled. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Notice there is a future day when he truly will rule and reign and put all of his enemies under his feet. He continues here, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Where does this come from? Psalm 110, as we wrap this up and tie this all together, Psalm 110 is a passage of Scripture that I simply do not recall hearing a large amount about in all my years of being under Bible conferences and sermons and revivals and special meetings and chapels and school and church and college. All of this has been an amazing revelation to me in the last number of years. Psalm 110 is the most, hear this, the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. Verse 1 has 24 allusions and direct quotes to it from the New Testament alone. Verse number 4 of Psalm 110 has seven references to it specifically, all of them in Hebrews. And we looked at that uh, when it refers to Melchizedek. But Psalm 110 is a passage of Scripture that is so misunderstood now. In my dive into this passage over the last few years, I've been amazed at, at uncovering all that it says about the Christ. This is a Psalm of David, but this is all a prophecy about the Christ who would come. We find this in Jesus' life. The, the, the uh, uh, Pharisees and the scribes were often um, challenging his authority 
And Jesus multiple times brought up this passage of Scripture to talk about who he was. They knew that a son of or descendant of David would take the throne one day. And Jesus wanted them to see clearly that David was not writing this prophetic passage, Psalm 110 in the Old Testament, to point to himself or to anyone else other than Jesus Christ, God's and our Messiah. This is a a fascinating passage. The other thing that I discovered, though, in all of this was that it is so misunderstood. You do a search for Psalm 110 and you will find people talking about everything being under your feet. Christ is the head of all things. The church, we are the body of Christ. And so all things have been put under our feet. And you've got to realize who you are. And you got to realize what you have. And you got to face the day in the mirror saying, look at me. I am a conqueror. Everything is under my feet. And you get these all kinds. The, the internet's full of them. Full of these people who want you to think that this passage is all about you. L- listen to just one excerpt. This is for us. We are the body of Christ. The enemies are under our feet. God is telling us to have the same throne attitude as Jesus. Simply to rest while He makes our enemies our footstool. So with each passing day, face all things, including the defeated enemies of sickness and disease, poverty, depression, and all kinds of curses, they are under your feet. Sounds good, doesn't it? This is how you get an offering. (laughs) The Bible warns of a day when people would not endure doctrine but they would gather to themselves teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. When it comes to interpretation, this is very important. It's another reason that we we here focus, and I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. This is one of those phrases that you'll remember me by, right? If I left tomorrow, you'd remember. Integration, not isolation. When we come to the Bible Integration is the key, not isolation. If you pick and choose the scriptures, you can make Psalm 1 refer to you. And you can give people the feel-good, prosperity, message, gospel, all wrapped up into a bundle of, of just have faith and give me a few bucks to pay the jet fuel for my Lear, and, and we're all good, Right? It's not about that. It's about integrating. And so are there other passages of scriptures that would tell us that disease and sickness and poverty is under our feet, that we are champion over them? Where are the apostles? (laughs) Wouldn't just a, 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 you know, an elementary grade question would take care of this thinking. Did they battle with sickness? Did they battle with disease? Did not our Lord himself say that he had no place to lay his head? It doesn't hold up to the Scriptures. What does hold up to the Scriptures is the number of times that this passage is used to say, God, Jehovah, the supreme creator of all the universe, has declared that the Son would sit at his right hand until all the enemies have been destroyed. When Christ accomplished his high priestly work, laid his life down. No man takes it from me. I willingly lay it down. When Christ laid down his life as a sacrifice for our sins, three days later was raised by the power of God after a number of uh, of days teaching his apostles, or the disciples, 
He was res- or ascended to the heavens. He took his place at the right hand of God, exalted, King of kings and Lord of lords. But there's still coming a day that is unfinished. And that is the day that we must always think about. Psalm 110, let me just encourage you to memorize this passage of Scripture. It's only seven verses. Memorize it. Take the M&M challenge. All right, this will be easy to remember. Memorize it and then meditate on it because it promotes Jesus as our king and our priest and as a warrior. Uh, Let me look and see if we have this here. So Psalm, yes. Look at verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 110. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies, your people, will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The declaration has been made. There is coming a day when God the Father will say to the Son, it is time. And he will stand up from the right hand of God and he will make his entrance into this life, this world, this kingdom, and he will show that he is king of kings and Lord of lords. Notice here, before we get to the object we often think about, especially the Revelation 19 passage, notice verse number two. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. If you'd like to think about eschatology, I've told you this before The day of the Lord is often seen as a day of judgment and wrath and a day to be greatly feared. And that is true by a certain group of people. But the day of the Lord is a day of blessed hope and comfort and glory and power and might and demonstration of God's power to save us. Remember what Hebrews said just the last chapter? The pointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of the world. No more offering, because the next time He is coming, not to deal with sin, but to deliver, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting Him. And here this prophecy, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. All God's people will welcome that sight when the King appears in power and glory. I'm telling you what a day that is going to be. However, we go on to chapter, or excuse me, Psalm 110 later on. Look at verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of His wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. I don't want to get into the technical aspects of this, but the, the, the Hebrew uh, names of the Lord are very important in, in all passages of Scripture, and they're evident in this passage as well. It seems like the Son has been exalted. He's the King. He's the Lord. But God the Father is going to be the one empowering all of this. He's the one who will fight for him and make sure that the king, the son, rules and reigns. And in his path, all his enemies will be defeated. Question is simply this. How will he find you on that day? He is coming. Jesus Christ is coming back. How will he find you? The the beauty of the gospel is that while we are enemies of God and we deserve His wrath and His judgment, He's provided a way that we could be adopted into His family. We could have membership into this new covenant. We could have our sins forgiven all because of what Christ has done on the cross. And those who by faith look to Him are forgiven and accepted into God's kingdom. But for those who refuse, those who resist, and those who deny, 
and those who think you'll take your chances on that day, I would warn you, it is a great and terrible day. The day of God's wrath is not to be tried. One of the things that we're approaching here is another warning passage. It's been a number of months since we've looked at a warning passage. We'll hit number four of the five warning passages in Hebrews. I think one of the reasons he brings up this aspect of Christ ruling until all the enemies are destroyed is because he talks about in this next section, it is a fearful thing. It it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Another warning that today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Well, praise the Lord, we know that those enemies will be defeated, but the beauty of it is our enemy, death, will also be defeated. It's called the last enemy to be defeated, the resurrection on that day. May God help us to think about these things throughout the week. Father, thank you for Thank you for the word. Thank you for the truths that we can focus on and meditate on. Lord, help us to understand what Psalm 110 means for our past, our present, and our future. Lord, help us to take confidence and hope in that which has been accomplished. Help us to be settled and grounded in your salvation and your work. No matter what we face in this life, your plan for us to be made in your image, in your likeness, will come to pass. Your work as our intercessor goes on daily. Father, help us to rely on that and to draw close to you each day so that we may find grace to help in our times of need. And Lord, the new covenant, we long for the day that all will be made new. No sickness, no pain, no sorrow, no crying, no more death. We'll all sit around the table of our King and feast and fellowship with you. Father, if there is one who does not know that that is their hope, that that is their calling, I pray that you would do a work in their life today. Prompt by your Spirit, and may they not harden their heart another day. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Steve? Steve? I get excited when I think about Christ coming again. And there are several good songs along that theme. I'd like for us to sing 584, but I'd like for us to do it in a special way. So let me explain. 584, Christ returneth. If you look carefully at this, you'll see that we have a couple of phrases, if you want to call it that, that kind of end with that bird's eye or that fermata. Those couple phrases I'd like for us to take a little more slowly and a little more quietly. And then we get to that third phrase that in the first verse begins with that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory, that ascending phrase there. We will speed it up just slightly and we will raise the volume a bit. But don't raise it all the way because as we get to the refrain, We'll move along kind of at a stately pace through there, kind of, you know, a little louder there, but save your greatest volume for Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. And then on that very last part where it descends again, hallelujah, amen, we'll bring our volume back down to about the same volume that we will start the next verse, okay? So just follow me. I'll increase with the size of my pattern for the volume. Please stand with us and do it with me. It may be at morn when the day is awaking, when sun.
sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own oh Lord Jesus As was mentioned earlier in the service, if you're visiting today or if you're not a member and if you need to slip out, you're free to do on this last verse and chorus. But it's a very brief meeting, so you're welcome to stay and observe. And we'd love to fellowship with you later. That fellowship before and after the service is also a very important part of our gathering together. On the third, you're doing great. Oh, joy, oh, delight, should we go with dying no sickness no sadness no dread and no crying God up through the clouds with the Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own oh Lord Jesus how Thank you. You may be seated. 